And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Would you pray with me right now? Father in heaven, we thank you for what we feel in the service. Feel the anointing, the touch of God. And I thank you, Lord, for every person that's here. I pray the blessing of God upon each and every one. Lord, I pray not one word would fall to the ground, but that we would be able to receive it and then plant it into our hearts. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. What is the church? He says there in verse 17, he said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by Father in heaven. Now, he's talking about the revelation that uh, Simon had received, that Jesus was the Christ. And by the way, Pat, that was a very good thought. It's so easy for us to say God, but some reason or other, it seems to be in this day and age, we don't want to say the word Jesus. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you and I. Thank God, God had faith and courage enough to send his own son. But it was Jesus that hung on that cross. And it was Jesus that paid the price. And it's Jesus that saves the souls of mankind. He said, he, when he spoke this to him, he said, this was not revealed to you by man, but my, by my Father. Now I want to make a point out of this, because I want you to understand something right now, that you cannot just get saved or commit your life anytime you want to commit it. Because the Bible says, except you be drawn by the Father, you cannot be saved. So except the Holy Spirit's drawing you in, to a place of where you want to repent, you can't just get up and say, you know, I just think I'm gonna get saved today. Well, if you do get saved, it's because God's been drawing you in, woo wooing you in. I'm saying that because I've had people tell me, you know, they say, oh, preacher, I'm gonna live the way I want to, do what I wanna do, live the kind of life I wanna live. And when I'm on my deathbed, I'm gonna make my confession. I'm gonna do it just like you're talking about. I'm gonna make my confession. I've had more than one person tell me that. I'll get right with God on my deathbed. I thought, you know, uh, and I don't wanna scare anyone with the, the COVID. We're all scared enough about it as it is. But if you get the right kind of COVID-19 and you go on a ventilator and your throat closes up and you're uh, in a semi-comatose state, you know, most people are not praying because they're out of it. I think if they didn't get saved before the problem, they're not gonna get saved while they're in the problem, they can't talk. I've had people, I've had friends of mine, and I'm thinking of one friend in particular when I was in high school, and uh, he was a preacher's son, and he said, I believe in all of this, but I'm not gonna serve God. I'm gonna do my own thing. And he had a wreck on a motorcycle. Of course, back in that day, you didn't have to wear a helmet. And I suppose he thought his head was hard enough that you didn't need a helmet. You know, when you're about 17, you know, you know all the answers. You've got all the answers to every problem that ever existed. Just ask a 17-year-old to be quick to tell you exactly how to solve all the world's problems. I don't know if he got saved or not, but he's in a coma for about six or eight months. <coughs> And because of that, I wonder, you know, can you guarantee that you're going to get saved and get right in a death, having a deathbed ex experience? Can you promise yourself, make yourself assured that you're not right now, but you'll get right, you'll get right on that day? I've had a lot of people tell me that. We had a kid that used to come to the church every once in a while. He wanted to be a rough stock rider. He wanted to be a, a bronc rider and he rode bareback horses, and he got kicked in the side of the head. And I used to talk to him, you know, and he'd come to my house and I'd tell him, 
the most important thing you do is not whether you ride that horse or not, but whether your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he never would affirmatively say, you know, my name's written in the book. I've made that confession, I've made that commitment, but I'm a believer. And I don't know about you, but I've run into so many believers that it's just hard. Heaven's not going to be big enough for the believers. But heaven's not going to be made for just someone who says, I believe that there is a God. But heaven's going to be built for those that have committed their life to Christ. And he's going to build a mansion for those that are not just committed, but are serving him. I open up my heart. I serve you. You are my Savior. I confess my sins before you. I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus is building a mansion for you and I. But I don't know. You know, he was in a coma for almost a year after being kicked in the head by that horse. I have talked to him since then, and he's told me some things that had happened to him while he was in that coma. I just wonder how many people have a second chance when they spewed the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth chances down and kicked it away. I wonder how many people today right now are sitting in churches somewhere across America and they can't wait to uh, get through the service because the preacher preaches too long, the altar calls are too long, we sing too many songs, uh, uh, they're not the ones I like, uh, I can't wait to get out of here and do my own thing. I wonder how many people are in the church but they're not in Christ. They're not in the fullness of the glory of God. I would say to you, I would encourage you that uh, if you're not really totally committed to Christ this morning, today would be a good day to get your life right with God. When we see the violence that's on the streets, we see the death and destruction of America right before our very eyes. If you have to have something else to convince you that we are living in the end times See me after church, meet me in my office, and I'll show you some things that will literally wake you up and it'll cause you to understand we are in the last days. Jesus is coming. He's coming for the church. He's coming for believers. He's coming for people that have confessed Him. He's coming for people that are walking in the faith. He wants to, you to trust Him. He's coming for that person. If you're not there, see me and I will help you with all of that that's within me to guide you into that right place, that right part, that right program that will get you. You see, it takes a spiritual manifestation from God for you to understand spiritual things. You see, this is what Jesus is saying right here. He's, uh, Simon Peter uh, answered, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied to him was, blessed are you, for this was not revealed by man, but by Father in heaven. That is a spiritual revelation of the church. Churches are full of people that's going for the entertainment, the food, the, uh, the uh, uh, things that the church has to offer. But as far as the revelation of who Jesus is, they're a million miles away from that. And when you get outside the church, and the church is a small part of the world today, when you get out into the world, the name Jesus is just a byword, a cuss word. It's a handle uh, they put on, they, that they just use. It's never to develop glory for God. It's just a word that's out there. I'm just simply making a statement. If you don't have it, you need that revelation. You need God to touch you. If you're not praying for that revelation for God to touch you, you're praying the wrong kind of prayer. It's more valuable than a million dollars. It's more valuable than anything else that you could have on, on this life is to have your sins washed away and your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you right now, the most important thing for me is to make sure when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes that I'm ready to go up and be caught up because it takes a revelation from God to see that and the world just can't do it right now. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Now, I want to give you a Greek word. The word is ekklesia. And uh, when I first started out in the ministry, and I took a couple of courses of Greek and, and uh, realized I'd had enough trouble speaking English. 
and some of it's stuff. And there's a word in, that, in this book called ecclesia, and it means uh, an assembling together. And uh, I put a little phrase with it, ecclesia hetio theos, which means assemblies of God. I thought that was kind of a unique thing, and uh, proud of our church, our organization, and what we're doing. We're not perfect by any means, but uh, we're trying to head in the right direction. So I found this word, and it's a reference to people uh, meeting, people coming together, meeting, who uh, can come together and talk about what is the church, what is the ecclesia. It is a time when people come together to meet and to worship and study the Bible. Now, uh, if you're not into worship, you're going to feel out of place in this church. Yeah. Awesome job. A lot of our first worship team didn't show up today. Didn't phase Mickey a bit. The rest of you that are up there, sing louder. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? amen? Did a great job last week too. And I, I just want to say this about Mick because <coughs> we've had a lot of different people down through the years direct music. We've had people that really had a handle on music. I've always loved music. But there's a difference between listening to music and music that creates an atmosphere of worship. And if you don't believe me, get in some of these churches where they don't create an atmosphere of worship. Two songs and a chorus and see it Brahms. You have to have that place where you feel free. That comes from making constantly in prayer, praying, seeking the face of God. Sometimes he calls me. It's your job, not mine. You pick the songs up. I'm kidding. I've got a line up. I don't feel like it's right. So she changes it. That doesn't bother me a bit. It makes me proud to know that we've got a music director standing up here behind this piano that's listening for the voice of God to speak that she might put music out that would influence us and create an atmosphere of worship. Because after all, that's what the church is about. The church is for the first thing you want, if, you, if you're thinking about a church, the first thing you want in a church is you want a church that has the ability through the music to reach out and worship God and lift God up and put God in his rightful place. <coughs> now I know it's kind of hard sometimes, you know, that uh, we don't always feel like worship. But the Bible says, by him therefore let us offer up the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips, giving praise unto his name. Don't kid me, it's not every time I come to church do I feel like lifting my hands, patting my foot, and saying, hallelujah, let's get it on. Uh, and sometimes it's just not there. But you'll never see me go through a service when my hands are not up. And I'm saying, I'm here by faith today, Lord. It's been a tough week, and I'm going to worship you in this old body I've got. And I'm going to hold his arms up as long as I can hold them up. Because you're worthy of all praise that, that needs to be given unto you. The church has got to get back to what the church is all about. The church is about worship. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus. It's about making Jesus of the preeminent thing in your life. It's not your job. And as much as I love your family and you love yours and I love my family, it's not about our families. It's about Jesus Christ who died on the cross. You put Christ first in your life. He'll take care of your family. He'll help you on your job. He'll do great things in your life. He'll keep you from a car wreck. He'll do all the things that you want. And I've had more than one person say, are you the least bit afraid of the virus? And I have to admit, I don't know if there's something wrong with me or if my faith is just so high. 
you know, the virus just simply don't scare me at all. I'm not the least bit afraid of the virus. When I'm out and about, I'll put my mask on, I'll wash my hands. If God wants to take me home through that virus, I've got a mansion in heaven. It says so in this book, glory to God. And the praise is there and I'll have a glorified body and I can sing in key all the time. Can I hear an amen? I used to could sing. I don't know what happened to my boys. It stayed at about 50. It said, I'm not getting any older, and it left me. But it's about Bible study. And I, I, I didn't know, you know, sometimes, you know, Mickey can understand this, Pat, Casey. By the way, if you missed Wednesday night, Casey knocked it out of the park. I mean, this gal can preach. And she can fling candy bars and preach what the word and fly airplanes across the congregation. I was expecting that Wednesday night. We didn't get the airplanes, but I wanted to see airplanes fly across the congregation with a little thing written across the bottom of it, Jesus saved. I believe the true reborn, hallelujah, as it plumped somebody in the side of the head. <laughs> but we're getting away from the Word. I, I didn't know how deep that I needed to go on this. And my two favorite preachers, outside of the preachers we got in this church, Jensen Franklin, T.D. Jakes. Love the way Jensen presents the word. But I, I like a lot of the emotion and feelings that Jakes puts in it. And I don't know if you get this, and maybe it's because I just I keep asking for it and they keep sending it to me. But you get about five minutes out of a, their sermon and you listen to about five minutes of it. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. Neither one of those guys are perfect preachers. But they've got a guy up there in the sound booth that edits all the mistakes out. <laughs> Hello? You say, well, they're perfect. I wish we had him for a preacher. You'd have to get an editor to come with him. Because he has his mistakes and problems, too. Listen, it's been a while. But I've got Moses up a sycamore tree a couple of times in my life. And I enjoyed watching him sit up there. Somebody's got that other you didn't get it. Some, there's somebody out there saying right now, well, he was up that much sycamore tree. He did a good job. And he built the ark. Hello. But he said, and he was making a confession too. He said, some of my church comes for the emotion and the feeling. And he said, there's nothing wrong with emotion and feeling. You hear me preach on that. Not a lot, but I preach on the sun. It aggravates me. We have, can't have any emotion in church. We can have it at a football game. You with me? But he said, he's talking about this church. He said, our church has got to get back to the study of the world. He said, because too many of you people, when your foot, foot hits the ground, you're so unstable in your spiritual life that you wobble. And sometimes you wobble out the front door of the church and you end up somewhere else. You end up in trouble. You don't have enough word. Trials and tests are going to come your way. And you know what's amazing to me is why in the world, as we as Christians, how come when a trial comes our way, how come we get so panicky? 
like we've missed God. Oh, hallelujah, what happened? I've missed God. I got laid off my job. God wanted me to do something else. God's developing your faith. He's teaching you to trust Him. He's giving you life lessons. Some of the best lessons learned is in the valley. That's where the good crops grow. You never plant your wheat and oats and alfalfa on top of a mountain. If you want a good crop, you plant it down in the valley. You want it in those places. And the things that make a man and woman a deeper Christian in the things of God is when you're in the struggles of life. It's when problems are in your life. It's when you have adversity in your life. It's when everything is coming against you and you throw your hands up in the air and you say, I don't know what to do. Somebody needs to look at that person and say, it's Jesus. He's the answer. He's the problem solver. He went to Calvary. That was no picnic. And he died for you. The test of your faith is nothing to run away from. But if you don't have the book in your heart, how are you going to stand? How are you going to stand? Preacher, I've got three scriptures memorized. <coughs> okay. That's a start. You need to memorize three tomorrow. You can do it. It's just where you want to do it. So we need a little more ecclesia. We need a little more worship and a little more study in the church. But let's talk about the mission of the church. The mission of the church is it's a it's a it's pretty simple to me. It says the church is the temple of God where the Holy Spirit can move and work. Now I wrote underneath that, every Christian needs to move in the Holy Spirit. And now you say, well, preacher, help me on that. What do you, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean exactly what you're saying? Everything you do in this church, whether it, whether it be teaching a class or being a part of the prayer team or whatever you're doing, you need to move in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to move in your life. Because the people outside the church, the unsaved people, are looking for answers to spiritual problems. No one darkens the door of a church because they think we cook the best steaks in town. Amen. You want the best steak in town? Go to Cadillac's. Tell me when you're going, I'll meet you down there. And I'll appreciate it when you buy the steak for me. <laughs> Give me the president's steak. Thank you. People don't come. As a matter of fact, you know a lot of these churches nothing more than entertainment centers. And they just, they just entertain people. Uh, the last... Uh, training seminar we went to there was a guy there and he was hiring some people to bring three lions now we're going to turn them loose in the church but now you talk about an exciting church service <laughs> bringing three male lions into the church he's going to preach on Daniel and the lion's den One of you is going to do that inside the cage or outside the cage. If you have a lot of faith, you get in the cage with the lion. Can I hear an amen? amen. Some of you old timers, give me an amen on that. If you got faith enough to bring three lions into the church, get in the cage with that stinking lion. Hello? And I thought, you know, there's going to be people that haven't been to church in their life. They're going to show up that Sunday morning because they've seen lions in zoos and they've seen them on National Geographic. But they're going to see three lions in the church. And that's something. But the church is more than that. I think you can preach on lions without seeing one. By the way, I went to the uh, San Francisco Zoo one time. 
and I want to make sure I got there when they were feeding. And they fed the lines not up front and the top you had to go around the back and down the bottom. And they had about 20 lines at that zoo at that time. And they was taking chunks of meat, looked like weighed about 15 pounds, and had a little fork like a pitchfork and was throwing it in them cages. And them lions got to roaring so loud, I think that is why I have a loss of hearing today. <laughs> them lions would roar and they would squall and carry on. And people just, the cameras are just going crazy taking pictures of lions eating. And I thought, man, if you think that's awful, weird, you need to come to a men's fellowship meeting sometime. <laughs> Kitty Dick, put a smile on your face. They got real serious. How long has been around? But we're talking about the mission of the church. Mark 16:15. Let me share this thought, the scripture with you. He said to them, "Go to all the world and preach the good news to all the creation." Whosoever believes is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these, aside, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They'll drive out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and if they drink any poison, it will not hurt them at all. And if they place their hands on sick people, they will get well. I thought, you know, that's, that's, just an awesome thing right there is that's what the church is for. The mission of the church is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. You know, if you come into a church to see a lion and you see him and you go out, you've been entertained. But if you want to come to a church and you want your life changed, somebody in that church needs to lay hands on you. Somebody needs to pray with you. Somebody needs to talk to you about God, the things of God. If you're looking for counsel, you know, you need to, you need to find a church that's a Bible-believing church where the people in the church have a handle on God, the things of God. And you won't hear a fairy tale. You'll hear what God is all about, what God wants to do. The meaning of the, the mission of the church is to reach the world. Let me say this. I'm going to move on real quickly. There has been a hundred billion dollars worth of damage done to the cities of America because of Black Lives Matter and Antifa. They're, if you don't see it their way, they'll burn your city down. And I thought to myself, who's at fault here that would create that kind of hatred in this country that we live in? And of course my first thought was well, it's happening. Our school teachers teach a lot of this. They're in, uh, in uh, uh, Seattle. The first time they arrested people, 17 of them that they arrested for school teachers. And they were out on the streets. I thought, you know, that's a crying shame. If they're teaching that on the streets by teaching people to burn, loot, and carry on, what are they teaching your kids? when you send them to school. Now I'm not saying to homeschool your kids. Probably most of you are better served if your kids are in school. But you need to know who your kids' teachers are. It doesn't hurt to talk to them about their views and their, their ideology of what they believe. I'm just talking about who we are as people. We need, to, we need to find out where they're at. But I have to lay part of the blame especially in Oregon and in Washington and Southern California is about to burn up too. Um, literally, they have pushed the churches to the back burner and a lot of people, churches have just almost gave up because there's so much pressure on them to shut up and to get out of the way. But is that what God wants us to do? Is that what, is that, when there's opposition, is that what God wants us to do as Christians? Is to back up because somebody has a different viewpoint than you and I have got? I'm going to tell you, I think what part of the problem in America today is that we've took God and we've pushed Him out. 
you know, before Trump got into office, for the about the last eight or twelve years, God has literally had an X by His name, and He has literally been pushed out of the schools and the the, the whole uh, function of our our uh, government. And I think this is a byproduct of what's going on in the world today, is because we've had so many people try to appease people rather than say, if you don't believe that, believe it. This is why I listen. I, I might come in here beat up one of these days. But I've had people confront me on certain issues and I just tell them straight up, if you want to believe that, go ahead and believe it. But I still believe Jesus died on the cross to save your sins. And you don't have to live the way you're living. You don't have to be that kind of a person. You don't have to take that kind of a drug. You don't have to live that kind of a lifestyle. And I've had people cuss and rant and rave and walk off and it's not been a pleasant sight. But I'm not changing my viewpoint because if somebody out there disagrees with me, because Jesus died on that cross that you and I might have eternal life. The church has got to get some backbone. The mission of the church is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is alive and well. And I don't care what the devil says. And they can point out the faults of people in the church. I'm not serving the people in the church. People fail. People have problems. People have all kinds of issues. Uh, I'm not serving the church. Uh, the people in the church. I'm serving it, the man who died on a cross and was resurrected the third day and became my Savior and brought eternal life to me. I'm serving him. It says he was perfect. That's the guy I'm following after. Can I hear you? Amen. Amen. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. I don't care if it makes every atheist in the country mad. If I have to bend down and tie your shoes and kiss your feet to get you inside a church, I'm not going to do it. But I will present the gospel to you and tell you, you don't have to live an atheistic life. Jesus died for you. We need to present it to even to those that are infuriated with the name Jesus. And that's why people have got away from speaking Jesus' yeah, name yes. because it rips them on the inside. <coughs> inside. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me give you one more thought and then I'm going to quit. I can tell you're just really enjoying this message. This wonderful people. What is the church? Well, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it says it's a body. The body is one having many members. That's what 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says. Now, we're not all going to be preachers. And we're not all going to be singers. And we're not all going to be uh, heads of departments. But we're all going to be in the body. Yeah. And... If you take any part of this body and take it out, the rest of the body suffers some. If you lose an arm, you suffer a lot. If you lose your little toe, it'll hurt. And you'll do some suffering there, but not as bad as if you lost an arm. But you'll know, you'll know it's gone. So the church is a body, but the church really is a family. What we're looking for uh, as people, we're looking for people who will love us exactly the way we are. Have you seen the commercial where the guy walks in front of the other three guys in the store and he has bright blue hair? Has anybody seen that commercial? He's got, the guy's got blue hair and he's over there in the hardware store. Has anybody seen that? No? I wish I hadn't started this. You've seen it? You've seen it? We've got two of us that've seen it. I wish I hadn't started this because now it won't be funny or meaningful to anybody. Well, it'll mean to you, me and you. I love Randy. These three guys are t 
talking and it's really about something else. And the guy with blue hair walks in. Of course, he's got fuzzed up. And I thought, you know, blue's my color. And the older man says, don't stare, don't look. Don't look. I see him. I see him. Don't look. Look the other way. Don't, don't stare. I see him. And he's over there. And when he's looking through some stuff, wanting to buy something, he's got this great big, huge blue head of hair. And I thought, those three guys see him, but he can't see himself. Because if he could, he wouldn't have blue hair. He looked more like a redhead to me. But what we're looking for is family. We're looking for people that love us as family. Nobody wants to go to church where there's a lot of gossip and backbiting in it. Because it disrupts harmony in the church. That's right. People want to come to the church where it's warm and fuzzy. They, they can escape from the world. You're working on a job. You're doing whatever you're doing outside the four walls of the church. Some form or fashion, there always ends up being a struggle and issues out there. So when somebody's looking for a church, they're looking for a, a family where they feel safe. What makes a family a good thing is when there's harmony in the family. You want to get your kids in an uproar? Have the family, have mom and dad get in an uproar. Kids will begin to struggle. <coughs> your kids won't retain as much in school. They'll act out. Struggles will happen. You come back, com compound that, you get a church. It gets out of whack and people <coughs> get off on a tangent and they, they're gossiping and backbiting. I'm going to tell you, it, it, becomes, it becomes a hassle. A lot of people won't come to church. They won't be a part of it. Our problem today is we've got too many people that's afraid of COVID and I'm just praying with them that they'd have courage and that God would help them. But it's more, we're more than a body and we're more than a family. We're a bride. We're a bride. We are the bride. And it's found in Revelation. It says, come up hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. He's talking about the church. Now, I've married a lot of people. And I've never seen an ugly bride walked down the aisle of a church. Amen. They're all cute and they've got a beautiful dress on. And I've seen a lot of husbands stand right there. And when he would see her coming down the aisle, a tear would come down his eye. The thing I hated to tell him is that after you get married, You'll have tears coming down both cheeks. <laughs> I thought of that all week. I have debated, Mickey, whether I should say that or whether I shouldn't, but I, Mickey said I should have said it. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Jewish custom, and I'm closing with this thought, is the old people that's in the wedding party would wait and they would get ready to go meet the groom. And uh, it was an awesome thing. They spent a lot of time. And so they would march through the city with their light, their candles, or lamps lit and they would sing all the way. Everybody in town knew that they were going down to the Smith's house. 
because the son was going to marry this daughter. And it was a great big deal. They, looked, they wasn't sure how long it was going to take for them to get there, but they knew they were going to the Smith's house. And I think all the things that we're seeing right now happening in America today is, you know, should wake the church up. The bride adorned herself. She may have got herself ready for the groom. She put her fancy lipstick on. She got the right hairspray. She got the right color. She got the right dress. She got all of that done. She got her nails done. She got her toes done. Oh man, she's it's no expense. This is my wedding. You know, the Bible talks about us being the bride of Christ. Are we getting ourselves ready to meet Jesus? Because he's coming. If you don't believe me, look at the streets of Portland. They're killing each other. And a little town in Minnesota, it's obscure. Nobody knew about or heard about killing people in the streets. They're doing millions of dollars worth of damage. They're taking Bibles and they're piling them up in piles. And they're burning Bibles and they're burning our flag. And then they set all the uh, businesses on, on fire. They're going to, they want to destroy America and everything that we are because we're a Christian nation. We are built on Judeo-Christian principles. We need to get ourselves ready. Some of you need to paint your fingernails uh, and others of you need to get your hair just right if you got any. And the rest of us, we just simply need to just get a hold of God and make our hearts as right as we can make them because there's going to be a sound. The trumpet's going to sound and Jesus is going to say, come up hither and friend, I'm telling you right now, it's going to happen. Just as sure as I'm standing here, the rapture's taking place and we are the bride of Christ. That's what the church amen. is. Can I hear an amen? Stand Glory to God.